from from uh, let me welcome everyone from different parts of the world for our webinar series on critical transitions and complex systems or what we call CTCS, which is jointly organized by IIT Madras and Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research PIC. So through the seminar, we aim to bring together experts in diverse fields in complex systems such as uh, climate sciences, fluid mechanics, neurosciences, and we try to disseminate the state of the art in predicting critical transitions in complex systems. And we organize this on the last Monday of every month. And some housekeeping items first. We request all of you to turn off your microphones and please type your questions and uh, in the Q&A box and we can have them answered at the end. Now, with that having said, let me go to the speaker today. Uh, it's very, we have a very famous speaker, Dr. Holger, Holger Kranz from Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems. Professor Kranz studied physics at the University of Wuppertal, Germany, where he obtained his diploma in 1986 and his PhD in 1989 under the super, supervision of Peter Grasberger. In 1995, he obtained a group leader position at the newly founded Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden, Germany, where he has stayed till then. His scientific interests today cover dynamical systems, stochastic process, long range temporal correlations, atmospheric dynamics, and extreme events. Through his affiliation with the Technical University of Dresden as an adjunct professor of statistical physics, he has now supervised more than 25 PhD students. So I'll give the floor to, uh, i stop sharing and give the floor to the uh, uh, Dr. Holger Kanz and everybody's eagerly waiting for his talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice introduction and for the invitation to talk today here about some of our research, which is not directly related to critical transitions, in contrast to what you just said, but it's about instability in dynamical systems, and in particular, uh, it's a kind of extreme form of deterministic chaos, which might happen in spatially extended systems, and in particular in the atmosphere, and therefore, I guess, is of course also of relevant for climate uh, simulations and weather forecasts. So. Um, I will introduce uh, the main concept here, which is related to intrinsic hierarchies and cascades in a given dynamical system, and which in the end, if there were no cutoffs due to physical constraints, would mean that the Lyapunov exponent of the system were infinite. And this gives then some rise to the our ability of the system to forecast. Can you please share so, your screen? Sorry, ah, sorry, yeah, the share screening. You are right. <laughs> um, I do it immediately. Oh, sorry, sorry. Here it is. Can you see my screen? Yes, absolutely. Very nice. Thank you. Okay, good. Yeah, so the title of the talk is Power Law Error Growth Rates, a dynamical mechanism for strictly finite prediction horizon. And I acknowledge here my three co-authors that by chance all start with a B in their second name. But of course, this is not a requirement to collaborate with me just by chance. So um, all of you are aware of the notion of classical chaos, which means that we have sensitive dependence to initial conditions. And that means that infinitesimal perturbations of an initial condition will lead to a completely different trajectory. And on uh, finite times, we will see an exponential divergence of such nearby initial conditions. And using uh, this exponential growth of errors, we could define a prediction horizon for a forecast, namely the average time uh, the initial error grows uh, needs to grow beyond some tolerable magnitude so that the forecast becomes useless. And if we use this exponent, this Lapunov exponent lambda here, which has the units of an inverse time, and we uh, calculate a time scale as the inverse of this exponent, and this is usually called the Lyapunov time. And it has the meaning that uh, the initial uncertainty grows by um, one, uh, grows by a factor of E if we increase the forecast range by one Lyapunov time. 
And you see that um, in the time we can forecast our system, we have two essential quantities apart from the Lyapunov time, namely the initial error epsilon zero and the tolerable error epsilon tolerance, which renders our prediction useless. And formally, if we were able to send the initial error to zero, we could expand the forecast time uh, to infinity. Of course, this is only a mathematical game because in practice we are unable to obtain absolutely precise initial conditions, and that is what usually is called the unpredictability of chaos. Um, when we think about the atmosphere and in particular of, of the weather forecasts, this is indeed a dynamical system because what we have are certain quantities like the velocity field, the pressure field, the temperature field, and the density field of air masses. And these six quantities, which enter the minimal model of the atmosphere, are related to each other by a set of six equations, namely the three-dimensional momentum conservation, which gives rise to the Navier-Stokes equation, the energy conservation, which here is, enters as the first law of thermodynamics, the mass conservation, which enters as a continuity equation, and finally, we need an equation of state of air, and usually this is taken to be the ideal gas equation. And then we have at every position in space a set of equations relating these quantities. Of course, there is a complication that in the Navier-Stokes equation, we have a non-local uh, feedback from the pressure field, but in principle, this is a deterministic dynamical system. Reality is slightly more complicated because we have volume forces, we have radiation budget driving the atmosphere, we have the water content, we have phase transitions, we have boundary conditions, we have many, many, many other things, but still, nonetheless, uh, the forecast issue of the atmosphere remains to solve a deterministic dynamical system. Actually, it was Edward Lorenz who already, um, how many, 60 years ago, was able to reduce uh, the model for Rayleigh-Benar convection to a three-dimensional system of ordinary differential equations, which nowadays in the nonlinear dynamics community, everybody knows very well. And this is, was the first system where someone was able to simulate or to calculate the solutions numerically and to show that indeed they are chaotic or that there exists something like what we call nowadays chaos. It was the same Edward Lawrence who a few years later realized that in weather forecasting it is more complicated than just the simple three-dimensional chaos uh, due to the multi-scale property of turbulence. And it was another famous person, Louis Fry Richardson, Richardson, who already before Lawrence found his simple three-dimensional ODE model, tried to compute a numerical uh, weather forecast, and he published this in his famous book, Weather Prediction by Numerical Process, and uh, he was essentially using these uh, six coupled partial differential equations I was showing before, uh, discretizing them in space and time and calculating by hand a six uh, hour weather forecast. And it took him about six weeks, at least this is what was report reported. And he had the vision to create a huge parallel computer using humans as computers and to thereby propagate the current state of the atmosphere using these deterministic equations. And he had a mass message passing interface, which was uh, supposed to consist of paper sheets. So he was extremely visionary. And um, nowadays we have these things implemented on the computer. And the left panel here shows uh, results from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts about the gain in accuracy of weather forecasts over the time. Maybe almost invisible is uh, the labeling on the horizontal axis, which issues the year at which the corresponding forecasts have been performed. And on the vertical axis, you see uh, a so-called um, correlation coefficient which shows the accuracy of the forecasts on a, a logarithmic scale. 
And what we see here is that as a function of time starting in 1983 up to most recent, the forecast skill has improved. Actually, what is interesting here is you see an upper and a lower, lower limit of these colored areas, and this affects forecasts on the northern and the southern hemisphere. And you see that until the massive use of satellite remote sensing, the forecasts on the southern hemisphere were still much less skillful than on the northern, simply because of the lower uh, density of measurement stations and the larger uh, oceanic areas where there were no good initial conditions available. So that means part of this forecast, this gaining forecast skill is related to improved knowledge of the current state as initial condition. Of course, also there is progress in modeling in the physical uh, cont contents of these um, weather models, and of course, also, also in the spatial, the temporal resolution. What we see here are four different colors, the blue for the three-day forecast, the reddish one for five-day forecast, then for seven-day and for 10-day forecast. And what one concludes from this figure is when you fix a certain level of accuracy, for instance, here, you see that what is nowadays achieved by a five-day forecast was 20 years ago achieved by a three-day forecast. And from this sketch, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts concludes that by progress in both observing the initial condition and by improving the models, one can push forward the prediction horizon of current day weather forecasts by about one day per decade. The, this is here in my slides opposed by a very famous paper, which has uh, hundreds of citations and uh, is much more optimistic than this plot from the European Center. So they predict that ensembles high resolution uh, forecasts with a resolution of one kilometer or better, and with the current um, complexity of modeling all these processes, including cloud microphysics and other uh, issues, that one would be able to push forward the forecast horizon into the multi-seasonal range for weather and into the multi-decadal range for climate. Uh, this is a very strong a statement compared to the fact that nowadays the forecast skill is something like in the, in the range of 10 days into the future that one might be able to go into the multi-seasonal range. And there are indeed long-standing concerns that multi-seasonal range might be out of reach. And it started with Lawrence, who in 1969 said that the limits of predictability in weather forecasting might be related to the fact that weather is a multi-scale system and that the enhanced instability of small-scale motion might destroy predictability also on larger spatial scales. And there is a I, I listed here just three such references, but there exists about 10 in total in the literature where people uh, pointed out that indeed um, the fact that we have storm instability on small spatial scales might be relevant for our inability to make better forecasts on longer ranges. The most recent one here from a group of authors from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast. Um, here is a sketch why there might be this problem with small scales. So I represent here textbook knowledge about the different structures which we have in atmospheric motion on the horizontal showing the spatial scales and on the vertical showing the associated temporal scales of these phenomena. And on the very large scales, we have the so-called planetary waves. So these are, for instance, Rossby waves, which are uh, living on the size of the circumference of the globe. That means on tens of thousands of kilometers. And they have lifetimes on, and um, changes over the time scale of weeks to months. So these are these very large scale phenomena and are simultaneously also very slow phenomena. 
On the next scale, we have, for instance, the high and low pressure systems with a diameter of a few thousands of kilometers and the lifetimes of a few days to a week. And then we can go down all the scales, for instance, here tornadoes with a diameter of, of uh, 50 to, to a few hundred meters, which live uh, minutes to hours, or even here the really small scale uh, blue sky turbulence, which is as you see here, a bit disrupted. So the scales here are even much, much smaller and the lifetimes are estimated to be of the order of seconds. So that means we have in the atmosphere this hierarchy of phenomena, which is both a hierarchy in space and a hierarchy in time. And we have this evidently this strong coupling between a temporal scale and spatial scale. So small scale phenomena are very fast and large scale phenomena are quite small. And now the question, of course, one question could be, why is there this strong coupling? And this is something I will not answer in this talk. This is just uh, given by evidence. The second is now, does this instability on small scale have effects on our ability to predict on the large scales? Because evidently, when we make weather forecasts, we are interested essentially in the uh, lifetimes or on the horizon of these low and high pressure systems and related to that of uh, convection and moisture transport. One could also invert the question, which I am discussing here about the stability, namely when we agree on the fact that the small scale motion is highly unstable and that we might estimate a larger Slyapunov exponent related to the small scale turbulence is of the order of one per second. So the Lyapunov time would be one second. How would we then be able to predict weather on the time scale of several days, which is thousands of seconds? And uh, the answer might be given by, oops, sorry, by the fact that the error growth rate is not a constant as in low dimensional simple chaos, but it might depend on the scales and the magnitudes of errors as shown here. So in the error, in the time evolution of the error, there might be a magnitude or scale dependent exponent here and not just a constant. And actually concepts like that had been proposed already more than 20 years ago as a so-called finite size Lyapunov exponent. Finite size Lyapunov exponent exactly means that the error growth rate is not a constant, the one which we find in the infinitesimal limit of, of infinitesimal errors, but that it might be related to the magnitude of errors. And um, we tried to, to interpret this in the spirit of this atmospheric dynamics by considering what would happen if our error growth rate, that means the scale dependent kind of Lyapunov exponent, were an inverse power of the error magnitude. That means small scale errors would have a strong, strong error growth rate and large scale errors would correspondingly have a low rate governed by this negative power here. And if we insert this in the time evolution of errors, then we find essentially a power law for the growth of the error as a function of time. So this error growth here is dominated by t to the power one over beta. And if we then invert this for the prediction horizon by using some tolerable error magnitude, then we see that even in the limit that the initial error goes to zero, there is a finite prediction horizon which only depends on the tolerable magnitude of the error. So this assumption that we have an, an inverse power law for the divergence of the error growth rate has two conclusions or has, has would explain two things. It would on the one hand explain why we can predict rather far into the future, namely simply because the error growth slows down, the bigger the errors become. But it would on the other hand say that we are not able to push this forecast horizon uh, 
more into the future by ever increased precision of the initial condition. And I try to show this in this sketch here, where we have the linear time axis on the horizontal and we have a logarithmic axis for the error on the vertical. And the classical exponential error growth, which is predicted by having a constant Lyapunov exponent, refers to the blue lines here. So the error grows exponentially in time and on the semi-logarithmic axis, this is just straight lines. And if we assume that here we have the tolerable error magnitude beyond which our forecast becomes useless, then we see when improving the error, the initial condition error, reducing it by one order of magnitude, we would push forward the forecast horizon by one Lyapunov time. This is what is the classical concept of chaos. If now instead we have this power law error growth, which comes from the power law divergence of the error growth rate, we would observe these orange lines here, which are curved, and where on the one hand the flattening here allows us to make predictions over considerable time intervals, but on the other hand the steepening at the low values would render the gain in precision into less low, shorter and shorter time intervals into the future. So that means improving, improving, improving the initial condition error would not bring us equal time intervals into the future, but would give us less and less gain. Of course, if we take this here serious, the true Lyapunov exponent of the system would be infinite because we would go down here until we have an infinite slope. And this is unphysical because we have to expect some cutoff uh, at the small scales where this behavior most certainly should break down. But at least this would be here a mechanism which could provide huge instability on the very small scales and would provide uh, less instability on the large scales. So can we propose a model system which has such a behavior? We are engineering one which is quite simple. We start from a low dimensional chaotic system, let's say the classical three dimensional Lorentz system with just one positive Lyapunov exponent and which has a finite spatial extent of its attractor. You all can imagine this well-known Lorentz attractor. But now, inspired from the atmospheric dynamics, we construct, construct a hierarchy of uh, such models by rescaling both the time and the spatial extent. And we choose scaling factors so that the systems with a smaller spatial extent are much faster. So we choose here tau and alpha for every level of our hierarchy, such that we get a set of systems which get increasingly smaller and at the same time increasingly faster. And if they were uncoupled, the Lyapunov exponent of the smaller systems were just the corresponding multiples of the Lyapunov exponent of the, so to say, the, the mother system from which we start. Of course, in order to make it now a, a connected model, we have to introduce some coupling here. And we assume that the coupling is sufficiently weak so that the Lyapunov exponents are not too strongly distorted and that in particular all the systems stay chaotic. So now for the suitable choice of these um, constants tau and alpha, we have a top level system which has a large attractor diameter and is slow and we have a set of smaller and smaller systems which are faster and faster. And if we simulate this just for three levels for didactical purposes, we can uh, construct these uh, tau and alpha such that we can see the different chaotic regimes separately. So if we imagine here over the time axis and here the logarithmic of the logarithm of the in, of the error of the difference between a reference trajectory and a perturbed trajectory, when we start with a very small perturbation, then what we would first see is the largest instability governed by the Lyapunov exponent of the smallest and fastest subsystem. But since the subsystem was scaled also in space, the trajectory in this subspace cannot diverge more than 
the attractor diameter in this subspace, which is small. And what happens then with the distance of the two full phase space vectors? They can only diverge in the second largest subspace where the attractor has a second, second largest diameter. But in this space, the Lyapunov exponent is much slower because of the different tor. And therefore, the error continues to grow more slowly until also in this subspace, the trajectories have diverged as much as they can. And what remains is space to diverge in the largest attractor range with the lowest Lapunov exponent, which then gives us here the visibility of the third Lapunov exponent, which is the smallest. If we look at the error growth rate as a function of the error magnitude, we see that when the error is still small, it is almost governed by the largest Lyapunov exponent in the intermediate range, by the second largest, and in the largest range, then by the smallest Lyapunov exponent. So indeed, this design system with these three levels of diameters and three levels of space of temporal acceleration, it shows large Lyapunov exponents when the errors are still very small, and it shows correspondingly smaller Lyapunov exponents or error growth rates when the errors become bigger. We can now refine the system and introduce more levels, and then um, the steps in between get smeared out, and what we observe here is nicely an error growth with a power law, t to the one over beta, and we see an error growth rate as a function of the error magnitude with a negative power e to the minus beta, so diverging error growth. And this beta in our model, or the one, my, one over beta in our model, is given by the ratio of the logarithms of the spatial scaling factor and the temporal scaling factor. So in this model, these are parameters which we can adjust. And here we had them adjusted so that beta is roughly 0.3. And indeed, these numerical results nicely represent this. As said before, in physical systems, we ex have to expect some cutoff in these behaviors here. And here, of course, having only five levels, uh, there is a finite fastest Lyapunov exponent, which leads to a cutoff in the error growth rate at some constant value, only on a finite range of times and a finite range of errors. Okay, but this shows one can construct a model where indeed such um, uh, sorry such a diverging instability at small scales can be found. So this was uh, still a coupled low dimensional system, and the question is whether one can also propose more realistic models of the atmosphere, which should be spatially extended systems. And together with my collaborator, Unek Bettner from Prague, we have designed, similar to the Lorentz model from 1996, a system which is spatially extended and has three spatiotemporal scales. That means it has uh, three length scales and three time scales. And Indeed, and it is similar to the Lorentz system modeling, a single latitude circle and the convective transport along this circle. And indeed, in this system, we could uh, reproduce such findings. That means we could show that there is uh, a large instability of the small scale motion and a slow instability of the large scale motion, and that one could simulate with these three uh, levels here also such kind of error uh, growth phenomena. But uh, this also still was a not so physical system and therefore together with uh, Burak Buranua, we uh, were trying to simulate a turbulence, a really truly turbulent system. So the idea would be that these hierarchies which we see in the atmosphere are to a large amount uh, consequence of the turbulent dynamics in the Navier-Stokes equations, and that one might be able to see uh, such phenomena also in a purified uh, Navier-Stokes simulation. So what uh, we were using here is 
really a three-dimensional domain in a cubic with, with periodic boundary conditions and with some uh, forcing in order to generate here some turbulent motion in this uh, unit cell. And then we were comparing the direct numeric simulations with so-called large eddy simulations on different uh, spatial cutoff uh, scales. So large eddy simulation means that one expands uh, the motion in suitable modes, such as Fourier modes, and introduces a cutoff at a certain high uh, wave number or short wavelength, and then uh, applies a so-called closure scheme. That means the leakage into the non-resolved degrees of freedom has to be compensated by some average back action of these, which then is a so-called closure scheme. And one has then explicit control about this cutoff scale and the general idea of these large eddy simulations is that one has a faithful representation of the dynamics on scales which are uh, much bigger than this delta. And of course, one ignores everything which is below this delta. And if we now perform these numerical simulations, we uh, see two interesting phenomena here. The one is one should report the units of the cutoff length delta and also of our Lyapunov exponent in so-called Kolmogorov units. That means in units which are adapted to the Reynolds number of the system. And then we see here a nice uh, data collapse of simulations for three different Reynolds numbers from 20,000, 30,000, and 40,000. But the main, of course, the, the main result here in view of this current talk is that when we report the largest Lyapunov exponent after this rescaling as a function of the cutoff length scale, then we see this increase of the Lyapunov exponent with decreasing cutoff length scale. That means the better we resolve the fine scale structures, the stronger is the instability and the data allow uh, or yeah, allow us to fit an inverse power, a, div a diverging power law here with this power beta, which in this case is about minus one quarter. So that suggests that really in fully developed turbulence, we see this divergence of the error growth rate when we go to finer and finer scales. And the last question to answer is, is this also observed in real weather forecasts? And unfortunately, we are not able to run experiments, I mean, numerical experiments for error growth in such weather forecast uh, schemes ourselves. But we found a nice paper in the literature, which is now almost 20 years old, where people from the Maryland group had performed such error growth experiments with the global forecast system of the National Center for Environmental Prediction. And what they did was running a trajectory as the so-called ground truth, and then perturbing it with an initial perturbation of a given magnitude, and then studying how, as a function of time, these two trajectories diverge from each other, and report this divergence rate or error growth rate as a function of the current relative error magnitude. And what they see here in their paper is this cloud of data. So in agreement with what I was saying, they see a large instability. That means a large error growth rate for very small error magnitudes. And when the error magnitude increases, then this error growth rate uh, decreases and goes down. What you also see is that at that time, they were trying to fit this behavior in a rather complicated way and were conjecturing different regimes. And we instead were using this plot, scanning it with some suitable scan uh, mechanism where you position a little um, cross on every data point and then press a button and you get the coordinates of this data point. So we were scanning the data from this original plot here, not all, but a huge amount here and, and a few also here, and representing them on a doubly logarithmic scale. And you see 
not perfectly matching, but rather convincingly that these data are compatible with a power law with a, in, with a negative power of minus 0 0.6 something. And we can also fit uh, a four uh, prefactor here, which uh, we still also need in order to then insert that into our equation for the prediction horizon. Assuming the tolerable error is one, as in this plot here, it's normalized with respect to some error already in the original paper. Plugging in these constants here, the prefactor and the exponent, and we come out with the forecast horizon of this particular uh, weather forecast scheme or something like two weeks. So this all matches quite nicely. We have a concept for a scale dependent error growth rate. We have a toy model, this engineered hierarchical model of Lorentz attractors, which is able to produce such a behavior. We have a spatially extended toy model inspired by the Lorentz 96 model, where we can confirm that this behavior exists. And finally, we have these reanalysis of data from the literature, which also matches quite, quite nicely this, um, this um, image, this, this concept, and also gives us a value for the prediction horizon, which is in the range of current days forecasts, uh, forecast limits. Nonetheless, there is still one interesting issue, namely this was an exclusive consideration of the so-called initial condition error problem. Indeed, we do know that high resolution weather forecast systems like the one from the German Weather Service or from the Meteo France, they are run for short time only. But that does not necessarily mean that the high resolution forecasts really break down after that time, but this is partly also due to the limited resources because the high uh, precision, high resolution models, they do not only require the high resolution in the spatial domain, but correspondingly in the temporal domain in order to meet the criteria for the integration of partial differential equations. So what is ignored when I say the high resolution models, they have high instability and therefore might not lead to high uh, resolution forecasts in the long run. The, the, the issue which is ignored is that of course the low resolution models which have might have less instability have in addition their model error. That means in order to evaluate prediction skill, one should not rely on these um, error propagation experiments as we were doing, but one really has to compare the model forecast to reali re reality. And this is done by running a forecast and by having an observation, and then for instance, computing the average root mean square prediction error as the square difference between forecast and reality. And now we have recent work where we uh, did not, of course, make real forecasts and have real reality, but where we have a high resolution model and a low resolution model of the simplified Lorentz 96 spatially extended system, and where we make forecasts with the low resolution or with the high resolution uh, model and compare it to the solutions of the high resolution model. And the first preliminary results, which I cannot show you in, in quantitative detail right now, because it's work still in progress, indicates that although in the high resolution models, the ensemble spread is much faster than in the low resolution models, the uh, forecast error, the root mean square forecast error, nonetheless is better in the high resolution models simply because the accumulated model error of low resolution models renders the forecasts less uh, relevant for reality or less reliably. Okay, so then thereby I'm at the end of my talk and I want to summarize and also to uh, mention here a few other open issues. So I introduced here a concept for an extreme form of deterministic chaos where the Lyapunov exponent, the true mathematically defined Lyapunov exponent would go to infinity. Of course, this concept 
would be an idealization because every physical system has cutoffs at small and at large uh, length scales. Uh, the true Lyapunov experiment still would be finite. And in particular, in the fully developed turbulence where we were studying numerical simulations, we all know there is a congo of length scale or the dissipation length. And below the dissipation length, all turbulence uh, disappears due to um, viscous damping. And therefore, that would set a, a low scale epsilon at which this behavior will flip and then there will be uh, no instability anymore. But if we assume such a behavior of the error growth rate, then such a system would have a strictly finite prediction horizon because we cannot gain by improving the initial condition, the knowledge of the initial condition. We were able to verify such behavior in toy models and in the 3D turbulence models. We also reanalyzed uh, error growth experiments with operational uh, weather forecasts, which supports this idea. However, there are some open issues. And if you were listening carefully, or if my explanation were sufficiently accurate, you might have seen that in the low dimensional model and also in this, uh, this concept here, I'm referring to the error magnitude. But in the atmospheric uh, physics issue, I was referring to length scales. So there is an issue about the interplay of spatial scales in a spatially extended system and of the error magnitudes in this simplified concept of having a divergence of small, small magnitude errors. There is a second issue which is in particular uh, referred to in the literature, which I was shortly mentioning, namely that there might be a difference between three-dimensional and two-dimensional turbulence in terms of this instability here. And then there is uh, the final issue I was already mentioning, whether high resolution models, which are uh, less stable than the low resolution models, whether nonetheless they might be able to deliver better forecasts also in the long run um, due to the fact that they have smaller model errors. Well, with this, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm Looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much for this very nice <clears throat> talk. The results are really interesting. So I request the audience to type their questions uh, in the Q&A box. And in the meanwhile, maybe you can yeah. start off with questions. Yeah, maybe I, I have a, if I may, uh, I have a general question this approach you have developed, Holger, is, is very interesting. I mean, also with the development of the toy models. Uh, could one also think to apply this to uh, other systems with turbulent nature as uh, Sujit is studying with thermoacoustic instabilities and so? Do you think this could be a way to um, simplify in some sense uh, the full equations, but to have nevertheless a good model description. I think that is possible in cases where there is some intrinsic hierarchy of length scales and space uh, and temporal scales. So I was uh, motivating the whole, whole problem here by showing these different atmospheric phenomena. And in other systems also, perhaps in, in neuron systems, if one can produce a certain evidence that there is there are large scale phenomena which are slow and small scale phenomena which are fast, then I think that both the conceptual modeling in terms of, of such um, coupled uh, building blocks with rescaling space and time, and also the issue itself that we have perhaps a finite prediction error, a finite prediction horizon, that this can be transferred to, to such other systems as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, uh, have you seen uh, this kind of behavior in other kind of chaotic systems? Uh, 
No, uh, I must frank and say no. We have uh, focused on this issue of atmospheric dynamics and of the corresponding of the Navier-Stokes equations, because this is, of course, at the heart of atmospheric dynamics. But we have not yet looked into other systems where it, it might be present. Of course, also partly because the forecast issue is intrinsic to, to natural systems like, like the weather. We have not, I mean, I was mentioning brain dynamics, but I'm not aware of people really trying to forecast, uh, forecast the brain state in, in such detail as people are trying to forecast the weather, the atmospheric state. But I think this work would be a lot of interest to fluid mechanics to try to predict uh, other kind of fluid phenomena also. For example, as you can mention, predicting the uh, highly turbulent flow inside engines and so on. I think this method will be uh, uh, very much applicable and seems very interesting. Sorry. Yeah, yes, it's, uh, if, if I may uh, uh, or add, uh, this is also then not so far from critical transitions because, Holger, in the beginning you mentioned, ah, I have nothing with critical transitions. I could imagine that this could be really a very interesting tool for understanding some of these transitions. Yeah, so at least it's related also here to fast and slow dynamics. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, one can also interpret or ask the opposite direction, how does the, the slow dynamics, the large scale motion influence what happens on the fast scales mm. and the small scales? We do not see any questions in the Q&A box. Uh, please type your questions in Q&A box uh, and will be answered. If there are no uh, one point, what, what you mentioned is a slow, fast system. Uh, have you, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, started with some simple uh, slow, fast system where you have only two scales. Is this then uh, already, uh, can you reduce your approach also to such systems? Or is it trivial? In, in, in a two scale system, you would perhaps, I mean, yeah, in some sense it's trivial because then the fast scale sets the, the, the Lyapunov exponent of the system and you would presumably detect immediately that there are just two scales. But of course one could in a two scale system try to replace the, the fast scales by some stochastic process and say, I don't care about the fast scales in detail. I want to simplify the model and then one would arrive at a at a system at a model for the slow scales plus some kind of noise. And we have done some work in the past about exploring then the properties of the noise. That means the correlation structure and and things like that. And um, then one would presumably follow a different modeling approach and introduce multiplicative noise because. Uh, the statistics of the small scales then might be influenced by the values of the large scale variables. So that's uh, some, some feedback which uh, introduces a kind of multiplicative noise. Well, it looks like there are no questions as of now. It's not a problem. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I think I'll uh, take this opportunity to uh, thank you for this uh, very nice talk. And the uh, uh, next uh, seminar will be on May 29 by Professor Michael Small from the University of Western Australia. So thank you once again for the very nice talk. It was very interesting and a lot of ideas to work on now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to present this. Okay, great. Right.